Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. That's what Solomon, the new king, asked of God. When God invited Solomon to share with him at the outset of his uh, term as king, what he most wanted, Solomon did not ask for riches. He did not ask for military victories. He did not ask for, mon for uh, honor above all other people. He didn't ask anything for himself except one thing an understanding mind, a mind capable of discerning between good and evil so that he could wisely govern God's people. Quite a, an amazing request by the new king not for power, not for riches, not anything for himself personally, except a mind capable of discerning between good and evil so that he could wisely govern God's people. Would that today, as the Democrats come to town and the political structure of the United States becomes very obvious to all of us here in Chicago. Oh, that we would see that kind of intelligence and that kind of request from the leaders of this nation. I want to tell you a story today, and it's a story for all Americans but it is basically the story of white Christian Americans. It's the story that has led up to what we have in our Constitution and what we call the separation of church and state. It's very important to us, to all three denominations that make up this congregation, it's part of our history. It's part of our tradition. And it's not necessarily the most happy of stories, but it led finally to Article One in the U.S. Constitution, in the, amendment, the First Amendment to the Constitution, which says that the government shall make no laws pertaining to the church. That's really uh, an unusual, back in 1776, this was a very unusual thing for a government to say because it, it countered uh, 17, 19 years practically, even longer, of the history of religious dominance in society. If you lived at that time, if we all had lived at that time, we would have experienced in the 13 original colonies just the opposite of what is in the First Amendment. Because everywhere people came from Europe seeking religious freedom in the 13, in the 13 colonies, in almost every colony, they turned their situation backwards and began to practice among themselves and with other people the very thing they were fleeing when they came here. And that is imposed religion. A religion emphasizing the, the acceptance of the religious thought and the religious practices of the dominant group in their colony. It happened all over. 
The first group to practice this uh, twisted behavior were the Puritans in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They wanted freedom for themselves, liberty, they claimed, religious liberty, no more persecution by the governmental authorities of our people and the way we practice our religion and the way we worship and the way we believe. But if you're gonna live in this colony, you better fit in and believe the way we believe. We're, we want freedom from imposed religion by others upon us, but we're going to impose our way of thinking and our way of, of practicing our religion on you. Well, they tried this on a man named Roger Williams, who was more a Baptist than a Congregationalist or a Puritan. They put him in the stocks because he, he believed differently than they did. He had a different understanding of Christian action and Christian belief and what it took to be a bona fide Christian person. Uh, after they put him in stocks, they put him in jail. After they put him in jail, they threatened his life. And so Roger Williams took advantage of a moment of freedom and he skipped across the river into the adjoining, the neighboring colony of Rhode Island. And he formed a little village. And guess what he named it? Providence. Providence, where freedom of religion, freedom of religious thought and practice could occur without any threat of government. That would sound like providence to him, the way God wanted things to be. Well, it happened in Rhode Island. Rhode Island did practice freedom of religion. They even welcomed Jews in their midst who never, never pretended to practice the Christian religion, but had a different religion that didn't quite fit in. Nevertheless, they were welcomed. They were tolerated. They were not persecuted. The same could be said in the colony of Pennsylvania, where the Quakers came and practiced freedom of religion for themselves freed from the imposition of religion by the Church of England, which they'd experienced. Can you imagine the pressure it would take upon a congregation for the entire congregation to be so fed up with religion being imposed upon them, with the government telling them that they had to believe a certain way in God, that they would be willing to leave everything behind and face a perilous voyage across the Atlantic Ocean to establish a, a colony where they could practice their faith in freedom. But that's what they did. That's what they did. The pressure must have been terrible. The imposition and its aftermath must have been outlandish for people to be willing to give up everything and move away in search of liberty. Liberty, that was the big word in the 13 colonies. Liberty, political liberty, and especially religious freedom. That's what they sought. That's what drove them here, freedom, of religion, no more imposition by the state. Well, that didn't hold true in many of the other colonies. The Reformed in New York who became Presbyterians, the Brethren in Pennsylvania, Catholics were kept out. 
discrimination against the Catholics. Why? Well, because they had been the primary imposers of religion on everybody else. It was the Catholic Pope who threw Luther out of the church in the 1500s. It was the Catholic Cardinal who was the major civil as well as religious authority in Salzburg, Austria, who forbade Lutherans, 24,000 of them, to live in that city. And he drove them out in the winter, in the frozen Alps. 24,000 Lutherans driven out of Salzburg because they believed in a way the Cardinal did not approve. Many of them perished in that frozen land. The landowners among them were given a little more time to uh, sell their property and leave, but they just dispersed around Europe. They didn't necessarily flee to the Americas. But the Mennonites did. The Anabaptists, those who believed in a second baptism in, northern, in the northern uh, geography in Europe, in the Netherlands and Belgium, the Mennonites were pacifists. They refused to participate in the wars of the day. And because of their pacifism, primarily, they were persecuted and slaughtered by members of the Dutch Reformed Church. Here was the Reformed Church that fought against the Pope for religious liberty in Holland. But what did they do when they gained the power? They persecuted and killed Mennonite families. And so the Mennonites, to save the lives of their children, negotiated with Catherine the Great of Russia. And they moved east, not west. Their first move was to Russia because they made a bargain with Catherine the Great that they would, they would farm a certain section of Russia in exchange for the Russian government allowing them to practice their pacifism, which they did until Catherine the Great died. And when she left Russia, the system changed and they were persecuted once again. So off to the West they came. And they settled <clears throat> first in Pennsylvania, <clears throat> then they moved west, further west to Indiana, and then even further west to Kansas, and finally arriving there as some of the best farmers in the area, they, they stopped moving. <laughs> and the Mennonite tradition stopped moving west and settled for probably one of the last times as a movement in Kansas. But the U.S. did not tolerate their pacifism. When World War I arrived, the Mennonite young men were drafted along with the other young American men, but two of their number refused to accept their role in the U.S. Army. As pacifists, they were dedicated by their religious beliefs to refuse to participate in war in any way. And so they refused to put on the military uniform. Well, guess how the Army liked that? They were first put in the stocks, they were first put in jail, and eventually those two young Mennonite men were murdered 
by the U.S. Army for refusing to wear an Army uniform. Their bodies, before being shipped home to Indiana, their bodies were dressed as a final insult in a U.S. Army uniform. And when their casket was opened in front of those members of their family who loved them and members of their congregation who loved them, they were horrified by what they experienced as persecution. Or look at the story of the Mormons in American society, or the Jehovah's Witnesses in American society, or atheists, or the, the Native American Five Feathers movement and religion, all persecuted at gunpoint in many points until they were willing to accept a religion imposed upon them. Freedom of religion? Hardly. It's been a big struggle. It's been a big struggle. And the denominations, the Presbyterians, the American Baptists especially, and the United Methodists have all fought for the separation of church and state and against imposed religion. It was 1776, and the Continental Congress was meeting, trying to draft a constitution for a new United States of America. What were they to do about all these churches that were here? What were they to do? with the Quakers in Pennsylvania and the Puritans in Massachusetts and the Reformed in New York and the Brethren in Pennsylvania and the, and the people who were finally welcomed into the colony of Maryland. Two bodies especially. One, Roman Catholics, and two, Jews, both from Europe, and both suffering from persecution by whatever the ruling body tended to be religiously. It's such a mixed story. And a young man from Virginia named Thomas Jefferson wrote a line that became the First Amendment to the Constitution that government shall make no laws respecting the church. Isn't that something? And he had a lot of help from James Madison, too. Two American heroes for religious liberty. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. It's been a unique experiment, an American experiment first that is now spread around the world, that government should keep its hand out of religion. And it's true in many of the countries in this world. But many others still have a way to go. And the United States still has a way to go. And I challenge each of you to think about your heart and how you feel and how you therefore treat people who believe differently than you. There's a dangerous rise in anti-Semitism in our nation, a dangerous rise. If you can discern between good and evil, you know clearly how evil 
some anti-Semitism can be. You, like I, have seen in recent uh, uh, North European history what one nation can do when it decides to kill all the Jews. Terrible. Just terrible. So we fight it. We stand up for religious freedom. We protect other people's right to believe as they wish to believe, as God gives them insight to believe, just as we fight for our own freedom of religion. It can't exist for us if it doesn't exist for them. Give us wisdom. Give us an understanding mind. Give us the ability to love our neighbor's religion as we love our own. Many of the British North Americans colonies that eventually formed the United States of America were settled in the 17th century. I'm reading from a passage from the Library of Congress. Were settled in the 17th century by men and women who in the face of European persecution refused to compromise passionately held religious convictions and fled Europe the New England colonies, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maryland were conceived and established as plantations of religion. Some settlers who arrived in these areas came for secular motives to catch fish, as one person put it, in New England. But the great majority left Europe to worship God in a way they believed to be correct. They enthusiastically supported the efforts of their leaders to create a city on a hill, a holy experiment whose success would prove that God's plan for churches could be successfully realized in the American wilderness. Even colonies like Virginia, which were planned as commercial ventures, were led by entrepreneurs who considered themselves militant Protestants and who worked diligently to, prom to promote the prosperity of the church. I was working with the Roman Catholic Diocese of Oakland, California, in a planning process that took several years. And in one of our meetings, the bishop and his staff held a worship service, a mass. And they knew I was a Methodist preacher, but they invited me to participate. And I said to the bishop, am, am I invited to participate in the sacraments? And he said, of course, of course. He viewed me as a Christian person far from a church of my own denomination. Therefore, I should be welcomed at a Catholic mass. <laughs> I thought this is freedom of religion, isn't it? This is the Christian faith for all who believe. This I can do. So I did. I participated in the highest rite of the Roman Catholic Church and joined with them with others at the hands of the bishop.
to receive the bread and the cup of wine. So, my friends and fellow Christian people, when you hear, as I do, the noise being made from the political right about white Christian nationalism as what should be and could be and will be the religion of this country if they take charge. When you hear about that, how will you respond? Give your servant an understanding mind to govern your people able to discern between good and evil. First Kings, chapter three, verse nine. Amen.